The dragons that we know of from mythology and folklore may be fictional, although similar animals to them, either in their size, biology or demeanour, do exist among us. One of the most noticeable being the absolutely named Komodo dragons, large Varanese lizards that are known from and are endemic to the Indonesian islands of Komodo, Rinka, Flores and Gilimotang, and are also the largest extant monitors and lizards overall. They were first documented by Europeans in 1910, when rumours of a quote-unquote land crocodile reached Lieutenant Van Stein van Heinsbroek of the Dutch colonial administration. They reported that they could spit fire and grow to lengths of up to 7 metres, although said lengths more than likely came from over-exaggerations and inaccurate measurements from afar, and the spitting of fire could just be from witnessing them stretching their mouths and seeing the saliva dripping down from them. They were later a driving factor for an expedition to Komodo Island by William Burden, who, after returning to America with 12 preserved specimens and two live ones, coined their common English name, and also provided the inspiration for the 1933 film King Kong by Marion C. Cooper. Komodo dragons are indeed sizeable animals, with adults being capable of growing up to 3 metres in length and attaining weights of up to 81 kilograms, although some captive animals have been known to reach upwards of 160. Males are also known to grow larger and to be bulkier than female dragons. The revolution and how these large lizards came to be has undergone some revision as more is understood of them, as well as going over their recent fossil record. Until recently, the long-held perception was that Komodo dragons became giants due to insular evolution from living on island chains, with some suggesting that they became larger to feed on the dwarf stegodon elephants that once lived on Flores. The fossil record, however, has shown that over the last four million years, Komodo dragons, instead of being an example of island gigantism, retains the large body size of a mainland ancestor, and that much of their current range is very much relictual. Numerous fossils have been unearthed from eastern Australia that dated from around 4 million to 300,000 years ago, which all match nearly identically to the bones of present-day animals, indicating that they originated in Australia and later moved up to Indonesia. This also means that they coexisted with Megalania at the same point in time. One question that pops up because of this is why they went extinct in Australia while surviving on a few isolated Indonesian islands. It could just have been unluckiness in regards to climate during the Pleistocene, although more work needs to be done in understanding this. Genetic analysis of mitochondrial DNA shows that they are the closest relative of the lace monitor, with a common ancestor diverging from a lineage that gave rise to the crocodile monitor. Due to their size, they are apex predators and dominate the ecosystems in which they live. Their diet consists mainly of the plentiful Javan rooster, although they will also target eggs, birds, small mammals like monkeys and goats, wild boar and even water buffalo. They have also been known to occasionally attack and bite people, with fatalities being rare but still possible given their power and weaponry. According to data from Komodo National Park, over the course of a 38-year period between 1974 and 2012, there were 24 reported attacks on people, with five of them being fatal with most of the victims being local villagers living around the national park. Such is their prevalence for residents, that when people are buried in regions where dragons are present, villagers will occasionally move their graves from sandy to clay grounds and pile rocks on top of them to deter the lizards, as they have been noted to have the habits of digging up corpses using their strong forelimbs and claws. As with many other reptiles, Komodo dragons primarily rely on their tongues to detect, taste and smell stimuli, utilising their vomeronasal sense using the Jacobson's organ rather than their nostrils to track down prey. With the help of favourable wind conditions and the habit of swinging their heads to better evaluate their surroundings to detect prey, Komodo dragons are able to locate living or deceased animals from a range of up to 9.5 kilometres. Their forked tongues have a key role in tracking, with them having the advantage of having a greater surface area available for chemicals and smells to come in contact, also allowing for more precision when tracking. Their scales, some of which being enforced with bone to form osteodooms, also have sensory plaques connected to nerves to better facilitate their sense of touch. For a long while after they were described and documented, it was thought and widely so that Komodo dragons, while also ripping apart their prey using their powerful jaws, also carried toxic bacteria in their mouths, resulting from rusting meat, with their saliva also containing a range of highly septic bacteria that would assist them in bringing down prey, with it being stored in the interdentical slots on the margins of the posterior teeth, which came to be known as the infector killer hypothesis. After a bite, the resulting toxicity from the bacteria could then seep into a given wound, resulting in septicemia, which would then increase the chances of a prey item dying later if they did manage to get away. 
This hypothesis has however fallen out of favour, after more has been learned about Komodo dragons, and also the correlation between infection and predation. Research conducted in 2013 suggested that their mouth bacteria was ordinary when compared to other carnivores, and actually have good hygiene, with them being noted to also spend 10 to 15 minutes of their time lip licking and rubbing their heads and leaves to clean their mouths, so any rotten meat, if at all present, would be discarded soon after feeding. Their tracking of prey items after attack to then finish them off once weakened is also weakly supported, with one of the prey items most often used as evidence for this behaviour, water buffalo, while Indians running away and into water after escaping an attack, rather than being infected by the dragon's bite, instead of contaminated by the warm, faeces-filled water which they often travel to, which then causes the infections that results in their death. The infections therefore happen due to the external environment, not from the dragon, and considering reptiles consistently replace their teeth anyway, the idea that bacteria could build up in the way suggested should have been ruled out from the outset. Komodo dragons stalking their prey after attack for hours, days or weeks is also not well supported, as videos of them doing so are either misinterpreted cases of prey escaping and then being found by chance at a later date, or even outright staged. Said toxic bacteria has also been noted to travel from the carcass of an animal to the dragon, and not from the dragon's mouth to the animal they bit, and even so, it is usually disguises when the dragons clean their mouths. It has been suggested, and this time with a great deal more evidence and support, that they are at least somewhat venomous, producing an anticoagulant of some form. In late 2005, researchers at the University of Melbourne speculated that the Parenti and other species of monitors and agamids may be somewhat venomous, with a team involved in the study believing that the immediate effects of bites from these animals were caused by Miles' envenomation. Bites on human digits by a lace monitor, spotted tree monitor and a Komodo dragon all produced similar effects, with rapid swelling, localised blood clotting and shooting pain occurring up the elbow, with some of these symptoms lasting for several hours. In 2009, the same researchers published further evidence that they possessed some form of venom, with scans of a preserved head and skull showing the presence of two glands in their lower jaw, which were found to be able to secrete several different toxic proteins, with their effects matching up well with the previously noted ones observed after a bite from one of these animals. The biological significance of these venom glands has been called into question by some sceptical Varanid experts, who have suggested that the venom's importance and potency was grossly overstated by other researchers. Not only this, but many also stated that this statement of envenomation had the effect of underestimating the variety of complex roles played by oral secretions, and that the conclusions from previous studies had produced a very narrow view of the matter, and that said secretions contribute to many other biological roles other than to dispatch prey. The glands have indeed been noted to secrete an anticoagulant, although the potency of it has been noted to be fairly mild, and they also don't have the groove's presence in known venomous lizards like Gila monsters to properly inject it. Essentially, its significance is not well understood, and it is not yet safe to assume that they are truly venomous, only that they have some preteolytic anticoagulant properties, with some bite victims getting symptoms and others not. The definition of venom through its use in animals has been suggested by some researchers going over topics like this is to tighten the definition of venom. Currently, it's a broad term, essentially meaning any molecule secreted into a wound that is deleterious, although this definition includes a lot of animals that would not be thought of as typically venomous, like mosquitoes, ticks and vampire bats, which utilise numbing agents and anticoagulants in their saliva to better suck blood. Tightening the definition further would limit it to only including animals that actually possess venom glands, and utilise specialised delivery methods to inject it, although some have suggested it to be tightened further, so it must be proven that such an adaptation is essential to the survival of the given animal, and not just including molecules that simply assist in feeding. All in all, more work needs to be done to properly define what Komodo dragons fall under. Komodo dragons are ambush predators, and can suddenly charge at a target at up to 20 km an hour, rushing in and often knocking their prey down and going for the underside or the throat, often eating their prey alive if they incapacitate them quickly. Using their teeth and claws, they are able to disembowel and slash open their prey, also shaking smaller animals around, with them being noted to be able to kill pigs within seconds, as well as being observed to knock down other animals like deer with their strong tails. To catch out of reach prey, they can sometimes go up trees, standing on their hind legs, and using their tails as a support to catch more mobile prey like monkeys, although they have to be quick when doing this. Their bites are relatively weak, although they do specialise in cutting damage, preferring to slash and debilitate their prey. After catching their food, their strong and expansive throat muscles allow them to swallow huge chunks of meat with ease, 
with several movable joints, like the intramandibular hinge, allowing the lower jaw to be opened wider. The stomach also expands easily, with them being able to consume 80% of their own body weight in a single meal. If swallowing a prey item whole, like a ghost as an example, they may attempt to speed up the process by ramming the carcass against a tree to force it down, sometimes ramming so forcefully that the tree is knocked down in the process. A small tube under their tongue that connects to their lungs also allows them to manage this task without suffocating. After feeding, they then drag themselves to a sunny location to speed up digestion, with them regurgitating the indigestible parts of their prey, like their horns, hair and teeth, into a gastric pellet. Due to them being ectothermic, and having a typically slow metabolism, Komodo dragons can survive on as few as 12 meals a year. They will also shelter in burrows at night to conserve body heat, as well as allowing them to minimise their basking period the morning after, so that they become active more quickly. Their eating habits follow a hierarchy when animals come together to eat, with the larger animals generally eating before the smaller ones, with animals forming a mob mentality in regards to asserting dominance. When it comes to mating, male dragons will assert their dominance through body language, posturing and rumbling hisses, with individuals of equal size occasionally resorting to wrestling. They may also vomit or defecate beforehand when preparing for said fights. Losers usually get a chance to retreat, although there have been cases of them being killed and eaten by the victors. Mating itself occurs between May and August, with them laying their eggs in September, as many as 20 eggs are deposited either in an abandoned megapose nest or in a self-dug hole, with them being incubated for 7-8 to eight months, hatching in April when insects are most plentiful. Hatching is an exhausting effort for the neonates, which have to break out of their eggshell with an egg tooth that falls off soon after emerging. After hatching, they are, while very large for their age, as up to 30 centimetres long, are still vulnerable to predation. Even adults and older juvenile dragons are a threat to them, as they make up 10% of their diets, with Komodo dragons being known for being cannibalistic. Because of this, they spend much of their first few years in the trees, and live such different lives from the adults that they essentially function as separate species while at this age range. If approaching a kill on the ground, they will roll around in faecal matter and rest in the intestines of eviscerated animals to put off the hungry adults. They then take approximately 8-9 to nine years to mature, and can live up to 30 years, with their legs and tails becoming proportionally shorter and stockier as they get older and larger. Parthenogenesis, a form of asexual reproduction in which the growth and development of embryos occurs without fertilisation, has been known to occur with them. Komodo dragons have the ZW chromosomal sex determination system, where the ovum determines the sex, as opposed to the mammalian XY system, where the sperm does. When a female produces in this manner, they provide their progeny with only one chromosome from each of her pairs of chromosomes, including only one of her two sex chromosomes. This single set is then duplicated in the egg, which then develops parthenogenetically. Eggs receiving a Z chromosome become ZZ, male, with those receiving a W becoming WW, in turn failing to develop, which means that only males are produced by parthenogenesis in this species. It has been hypothesised that this reproductive adaptation allows a single female to enter an isolated area, such as an island, and then through parthenogenesis, can produce male offspring, thereby establishing a sexually reproducing population via reproduction with her offspring that can then result in both male and female young, although despite the advantages of such an adaptation, this may be detrimental to genetic diversity. Their genetics and resulting phenotypes as a whole also continue to be very interesting to scientists, as they are actually quite variable across their range, and the populations from all of the different islands can be recognised as distinct once you know what to look for. A report in 2003 reported a new colour morph from Ryung along the northeast coast of Flores, which are greyish yellow with grey and white speckled lower limbs. Whether they are just a local colour morph or something more is still unknown, although more research needs to be done regarding it. This along with other distinct populations shows that they may have been distinct for a long period of time, more than 10,000 years, or may indicate a complex colonisation history for the region. Komodo dragons are unfortunately however vulnerable to a great many factors. In the wild, their range has contracted due to human encroachment and activity, which includes forest clearance and savanna degradation. Many animals are scattered around non-protected areas, and as such, populations can easily become fragmented for these regions. As well as this, rising sea levels will have the potential to reduce their available habitats by about 30% in the next 45 years, especially concerning due to the low levels of land dragons prefer. Because of this, and due to only around 6,000 being left in the wild, Komodo dragons were classified as endangered in 2021 due to all of this, and their urgent conservation actions are required to avoid the risk of extinction.
More is still yet to be understood of them considering they are generally shy animals, with them being noticed by reptile keepers to be among the most intelligent of all reptiles, showing evidence of cooperative behaviour and bonding with people. Researchers have also managed to isolate a powerful antibacterial peptide from the blood plasma of Komodo dragons, VK25. Based on their analysis of this peptide, they managed to synthesize a short peptide dubbed DRGN1 and tested it against multi-drug resistant MDR pathogens. Preliminary results of these tests show that DRGN1 is effective in killing drug resistant bacterial strains and even some fungi. It has the added benefits of significantly promoting wound healing in both uninfected and mixed biofilm infected wounds. This goes to show why Komodo dragons and other wildlife needs to be preserved, as they not only enrich the diversity of the environments they're found in, but they can also benefit us in the process. All in all, I thank you for watching this video on these animals and that you may have learned something new. If you would like to see more from this channel, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And with that, I'll see you next time, whenever that's may be.